Daniel chapter number 9. I'm going to read a few more verses than usual this morning. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the numbers of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and he made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant, the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto the, us confusion of faces, as at this day to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to, unto all Israel that are near and that are afar off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faces, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he has set before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil, for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all the evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understanding thy truth. Therefore hath, God, hath the Lord watched upon the evil, brought it upon us, that the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. Now, as I was reading these verses, first thing that came to mind, Peter, when he was quoting, I believe, Deuteronomy, said, Our Lord is a consuming fire. And I have made an illustration of God's holiness and righteousness has a presence to it. When God reveals it, things start disappearing as if they were consumed in a fire. I mean, we can look at what one cherubim did to a whole army of Syrians, right? We can look at what the angel of death did to, Israel, or to Egypt as it passed over Israel. Now imagine the pure, holy righteousness of God being revealed upon the earth and consume it like a fire. And I don't know, but I just believe when we take all the works that we've done in our bodies after we've been saved and present them to God, when we get into the presence of His holy and right, that's what's going to be tried by fire. It's the fire of His righteousness, whether or not our deeds held up, whether they were wood, hay, or stubble, whether they were gold, silver, and precious gems. Right? God doesn't need to pour out fire. God just needs to be Himself, and everything that isn't holy disappears. God doesn't have a special vial that He's going to pour out where it's His judgment, and it's just a bunch of fire. He's just going to reveal how holy he is, and it reveals how unholy we are. I mean, Daniel, not a sinner. I mean, he was just as much a sinner as anybody that's ever been saved. But I mean, Daniel was one of the pillars that God could point to and say, that's somebody who fears me, reveres me, tries to follow my precepts. Right? You find long before he was ever taken away into captivity with Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Right? They were doing what God wanted them to do. They wouldn't eat the king's meat because it went against what God said to eat. And God blessed them for it. Then we know the three Hebrews that were thrown into the fiery furnace. Daniel and the lion's den. Right? But Daniel and the lion's den, Daniel had just been doing what God told him to do and he had been promoted to second in command over the entire nation. He answered only to the king. That's why the other princes wanted them to be thrown into the lion's den. They didn't want this outsider what they thought usurping them, but Daniel just did what God told him to do. God blessed him. Right? Well, now, we don't have time to get into the whole prophecy behind everything today, but Daniel sees 
the completion of God's judgment upon Israel to where they will be returned to their own nation. I mean, he was led away into captivity as a young man. We don't know how young, but he's young. He's old enough that they looked at him and said, he's pretty smart, king could have use of him. But his entire life almost, he's been a servant or a slave, a bondman. He was not free. He could go where he wanted to within the kingdom, but he couldn't just get up and say, well, I'm moving out of the kingdom. Right? He couldn't get up and say, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do today. The king would have had his head. And although he found favor in the eyes of the kings that God allowed to come to power, I mean, you study it out, one of them's the son of Esther, right? Tell me God's not in that. But anyway, we don't, we don't have time to get into all that. God reveals unto when Israel's going to be a nation again, but at the same time, Daniel has to see all the judgment that Israel has to go through to get to that point. And notice throughout all of this, he doesn't say they. He doesn't say the disobedient. He says we. Because when you really get a good look at how righteous God is, you realize how unrighteous you are. Daniel knew what he did every day. He knew how he sought the Lord's face. Even when men tried to write it into decrees that it was illegal to ask anything of anybody except for the king. To offer up praise unto anybody except the king for 30 days. Daniel just did what he always did. Laid down on his face before God and started talking to him. And I've said that I believe Daniel wanted to be a you know, good steward of the king. Didn't want to go against him. I believe he just got down and he just started saying, Lord... I don't need anything because you've been so good to me. Lord, I don't need to ask anything of anybody because you already know what I have need of. Right? I mean, I, I think I might have been able to, you know, stand up been a pretty good defense attorney before him that day. Now, he wasn't praying. He's just saying, God, you've been so good to me. I don't have anything to ask for. He had more. I mean, you study it out. Daniel, when he got the vision of, you know, the prophecy of the end times, you find that he put off all the nice clothes that he had and he put himself in sackcloth. Right? He didn't eat. They all thought he was going insane or dying. He wouldn't eat food. He wouldn't drink. He was fasting. And then God gave him the vision to write down the prophecy. Daniel had all the fine linen. He had all the nice clothes. I'm sure he had a few rings and chains and everything else to go with it. But Daniel didn't you know, covet those things. He had them, but they didn't have him. Daniel knew what kind of man he was. But yet when he sees the judgment that God's poured out, he realizes, I'm guilty of that too. Maybe not to the extent of others, but God sees in black and white. Sin is sin, iniquity is iniquity. It's either holy or unholy. So he counts himself among those that will be judged. It's the first thing I wanted you to notice. But then second, you notice that Daniel doesn't have any arguing, any explaining, any excuses. Verse number 7, he says, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. He says, God's still God. He says, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day, to the men of, and you study that down there, it means everybody that was one of God's children. Nowhere do you find that Daniel says, well, Lord, I did what I was supposed to do. How come I'm in captivity? No, you find that Daniel realizes, but by the grace of God, I mean, we get down to verse number 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against Him. He says, Lord, those days that I did what I wanted to do, that's rebellion. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is sin. And what does the Bible say about rebellion? It is as the sin of witchcraft. Daniel realizes one time that I didn't do what God said, I rebelled against God. He's still righteous. He's still merc merciful. He's still got a whole bunch of grace that he dumps out on us. But without God, I'd be in hell. He says, God doesn't owe me anything. He says, I should do the things that I do, not because... You know, I, I believe this. Daniel didn't do it for blessings. Daniel didn't do it so that he'd have a position. Daniel did it because God was God and he deserved it. 
I mean, we were bought with a price. Our life is no longer our own. God bankrupt heaven to save an old wretch like me. And, I mean, we can get over into 1 John chapter number 2 where it says that the love of God is perfected in us. What's that mean? Well, to break it down, God loved us so much that He put Himself in us so that we could be like Him. We can't be God, but one day I'll have a body like His. I'll be seated with Him. I'll be married to Him. I've already been adopted. He says, you can be in the family. But see, this is Israel. This is God's chosen people. That's a new covenant that we got. That's a covenant of grace. This is the covenant of the law. God chose Israel and said, you'll be my people. As long as you do what I say, I'll take care of you. I will be your God. In fact, originally, God was supposed to be their God and king. But then they wanted a king because everybody else had a king. And there's a whole other lesson there. Wanting what the world has. But anyway, don't have time to get there. But nowhere do you find that Daniel says, but Lord, why do I have to go through this? How come Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to go to the fiery furnace? All they did was say that they weren't going to bow down to anything that wasn't you. That they wouldn't even bow down to a graven image of God. Because God said not to have any graven image of anything in the earth, above the earth, under the earth. They said God said not to have them. We're not bound down to it. Especially one that looks like Nebuchadnezzar. Because I believe he had a little bit of a complex. But nowhere do you find Daniel say, Look, but God, why am I? He says, no, I, I belong a whole lot worse. Isn't that what Job said? Lord gives, Lord, God doesn't owe me anything, but he's still God. Without God having mercy and compassion upon us, we'd be in hell. Without God having mercy and compassion, we never would have been. Adam and Eve would have been in hell, and God would have torn the whole thing apart and started over again. But God loved. God had compassion. He's long-suffering. Daniel says, he's still all them things, but I still deserve to be in this situation. He's saying, God's no less gracious, God's no less righteous for putting me in this situation. And then you go on to study it out. Number 11, it says, Yea, all Israel, that includes him, have transgressed thy law, even by departing. Well, he doesn't say rebellion there. He says departing. What's that? Just a little bit of change. Just drifting away from the things of God. None say, restore the old paths. They say, let's try this new thing. Let's try and reinvent the wheel. Well, that doesn't apply to me. The preacher's preaching to somebody else. But I can still be right with God and do this. They departed from the way that God had given them. And don't look down their noses. God's given us everything that we need to walk the path. Yet how many of us ignore it or we construe it in our minds instead of figuring out what the Bible says? We, I think I remember what that says. He says, all Israel. Did not Solomon write? Trust the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and lean not unto thine own understanding. My understanding can confuse the things of God. That's why even after some 2,000 years and seven major translations, it's easy enough that a child can understand it. But yet, unless you devote yourself to it, it can confound the wisest men on the face of the earth. He said, Seek and ye shall find, ask and ye shall receive, knock and it shall be opened unto you. But Israel didn't ask. They didn't seek. They didn't knock. They took their own path. They departed then he says that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the, co the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because they have sinned against thee. God didn't pour out some brood judgment that he had concocted just for it. Well, I'm going to show them. No, it says that he poured out the curse. What's that? He poured out the cost of their sin. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It was only by the grace of God that when they did what God would have them to do, he pushed their sins back for a year under the law. That perfect, spotless lamb whose blood was applied to the mercy seat, it didn't take away the sin, it pushed it back. 
Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But God just didn't remit our sin with Christ. No, He purged it. Gone. But still, after I'm saved, I can't get away with sin. Well, I can get away with it. I just got to pay the consequences. I've got to stand before a holy God one day at the judgment seat of Christ and look Him in the eye, seeing all the love that He had for me, and I have to confess that I didn't love Him the way that He loved me, which is what we were commanded to do. I know, it's over. I didn't want to teach this, but we're already in it, so just hitch up with me. We're getting somewhere. We're not going to stay here the whole time. But we got to... God didn't have some special judgment for them. He just poured out the cost of their sin upon them. And it's only by the mercy and grace of God that He doesn't do that to us each and every day. I'm still in the sin-cursed body. My heart is so deceitful and wicked that I can't even know it. What if God poured out the judgment upon my heart, upon me? Even though I don't know it, it's still a part of me. Those fleeting thoughts that come into your head for a half second before you like squash it down in the back of your head before God convicts you of it? What if God convicted you instead of just convicting you for that, He actually judged you for that? Poured out that curse of sin upon you. The price that Christ took for us. But see, God's not an Indian giver. He said, I'll pay the price, and He paid all of it. Not just some of it. Not to take back whenever He so, cho so chose. But new sin. After we get saved, I can still pay the price for that. Because it's disobedient. It's departing from the ways of God, from the things of God. Nobody's perfect, what I'm trying to get to here. Daniel understood, that's why he said we. He's saying me and everybody else. Not just those that are out there, you know, they were the same in Daniel's days, they were in Ezra and Nehemiah's day. They were taking strange wives to them. They were embracing the customs of foreign lands. Everybody else was saying, well, this is the new thing, so let's just get used to it. Let's embrace it. We're not our own nation anymore. We've been assimilated. We've been taken captive, so let's just go all in. But there were a few, like Daniel and the three Hebrews and others, that said, even though we're under a strange kingdom, we're going to stick with the same God. But they were still in captivity. Oh, Mordecai, the uncle and adoptive father of Esther, he had the strange king, but he still had the same God. Raised Esther in that way. Esther, I'm sure, instilled those principles into her son. You know who that son was? Darius. Darius went running to the lion's den that morning. He said, Daniel, is your God able? He had always heard that God was. He was looking to see if God was real. Then you find after that, he had a lot to say about who could worship what in the kingdom. He said, everybody's going to worship Daniel's God. What he's saying is, everybody's going to worship the God of Esther, the God of Mordecai, the God of Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. Even then, people didn't obey. Right? Well, I see a parallel to them people and the people that we live with every day. For a while, God shook things up. COVID hit and everybody was in a panic. Right? I remember, I was about probably about that tall at the time, but I remember when the t Twin Towers fell. I remember church houses being open. And then what happened? People embraced and said, well, this is the new normal. Nowadays, we don't even think about it when we got to walk through a scanner and a blow dryer and everything else at the airport. And, you know, the MRI machines now that spin around you. We don't even think twice. I remember when you could walk to the gate and see somebody hop on a plane without a ticket. But nowadays, nobody bats an eye having to wear a mask. Eight months ago, everybody hated it. Everybody was uncertain. So instead of confronting the uncertain, the confusion, if you will, they embraced it. And said, well, instead of fighting against it, well, instead of you know, standing up and being made accountable for what we think is right, we'll just accept it so that we can move on. That's what people in Daniel's day did. Some of them, I mean, he said they were without excuse. 
They didn't listen to God. They didn't listen to His law. And then they didn't listen to the prophets that He said preach not only to the kings and the princes and their fathers, but He said unto all of us. He said we all heard it. But we didn't listen. So they heard. They knew what God was about ready to do. They ignored God's judgment. I mean, go read the book of Jeremiah. For 30 some odd years, God told them judgment's coming. Get right. And they didn't. So when judgment came, they, did, they couldn't blame anybody but themselves. So instead of confronting that they were wrong, let's just embrace this new thing. We're all Medes and Persians now. Nebuchadnezzar wants us to bow down. All right, we will. Except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Daniel wasn't there. That He was over the gate at the time. He had to watch who was coming in and out of the city all the time. Right, he was doing what he was supposed to do, and everybody else that wasn't busy was there. Everybody else bowed down. Not those three. They didn't conform. Right, so what causes people to conform when things get bad? Not conform to the things that God conformed to the world. Well, we find it twice. First, verse number 7, and then verse number 8. You'll see that phrase, confusion of faces. Okay, in verse number 7 he says, O Lord, righteousness belong unto thee, but unto us, confusion of faces, as at this day. And then he says to all men. Verse number 8, Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faces, to our kings, our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. Right? That, that caught me. I was like, well, that's, that's a unique set of words there. Confusion of faces. Well, you're going to find it two other portions, several times in each one of them, but you'll find it in Ezra and Nehemiah also. Same phrase, confusion of faces. Well, there's two meanings up first. There's confusion. But really what it's getting to is shame. He's saying there's shame on faces. Now when you know what to do and you do it, you don't have confusion. You have confidence of face. Your face looks as if you know what you're doing and that it's right. Now keep in mind also, God is not the author of confusion. So if we have confusion on our face, it's because we haven't allowed God into our heart. God wants us to be steadfast and sure with our feet planted on the solid rock. Right, God's all about security, assurance, hope, that blessed hope as it's written. Amen. The thing that strengthens our faith. Lord, don't help my belief, help my unbelief. Get more belief in me by getting more unbelief out of me. Amen. What we're saying is remove the confusion. But see, Israel, all they had was confusion. Because they didn't know where they were, why they were there, how they were going to get out, and what they could do about it. Now there were a few that they still did what God told them to do. They had a confident face. In fact, you go and study out what happened to Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were first taken in. They ate water and, you know, it really wasn't oatmeal. It was a whole lot worse than oatmeal. right? But they ate some stuff that was disgusting, but by the end of it, they was as confident and strong Right, as vigorous as the rest of them. In fact, more so, the Bible says. They weren't just confident that God was going to take care of them. They were worthy. I mean, they were, you know, well enough that they said, all right, how about this? After a week, if it doesn't work, we'll do it your way. Because the eunuch that was in charge of them said, if you guys eat something different and you come out all scrawny, he says, I'm going to die. So Daniel said, just try the Lord. In other words, he's saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. And then they were stronger. And every time that they were put on the... Confusion was brought to them. Why was Daniel arrested? You know, what did he do? Right? How'd they find out? He was praying in his own quarters. what did they do? Knock like peepholes in the wall? I don't know. Something happened. Somebody was doing something that they weren't supposed to do to catch Daniel. But nowhere do you find him asking questions. He's got a confident face. He says, if God wants me to go to the lion's den, I'm going to go to the lion's den. But God's still God. And it's right to do what God told us to do. 
So, you have those with the confidence, but those that are confused all the time, they're the ones that are willing to latch on to anything for some sort of stability. may not be much. Right? It may be a bunch of lies, but everybody knows that if you turn on the news at a certain time, you can get lied to at the same time every day. That consistency is enough for some people. Not consistency in what they say, but a routine. People can get used to a routine, even if it's a bad one. Right? So why are we talking about all this? Why are we getting into the confusion of the faces? Right? Because this is going to happen one day again. And it's going to happen a couple of different places, but one of them is going to be America. One day something's going to happen. I don't know what it is because Bob doesn't tell us what it is. Right? I know there's a great bear in the north. It may not be called Russia anymore, but there's going to be a government somewhere from Siberia that's going to come down and attack Israel. The Bible talks about the whelps of the lion. Well, it doesn't say anything about the lion. The UK is going under too. Right? Many nations across this, because the Bible talks about there are 10 world powers that are going to be remaining. Well, 10, and the last time I checked, there were about 263 countries on the face of the earth. It means about 253 of them are going under. And when they go under, until the rapture happens, God's people's with them. If we're honest and we step back, if we look before God, how many of us would have a confident, uh, confident face before His judgment rather than a confused face? But Lord, I thought I was doing right. Well, did you? Or did you know somewhere down in here when the Holy Spirit talked to you and gripped your heart that I'm not doing all I can do? I mean, our reasonable service is to present our bodies a living sacrifice. That means everything we do. Daniel understood that there was more he could do. That he had been weighed, he had been measured, and he had been found wanting. But what's our comparison? The righteousness of God. Right? There are those that when hard times come, they realize I can do more for God. And then there are those that when hard times come, they embrace confusion and chaos rather than the thing that God said is forever settled in heaven. Heaven and earth can pass away, but His word shall not pass away. God can take the earth off the map, but I can still stand on this. If God said there'd be no more earth, He can't say that there won't be no more word. You can stand on the Bible. But see, those that when hardness comes, what's going to happen? I don't know. Right? Maybe we're going to get some lunatic in the White House in, in November of last year. These are things I think about sometimes when nobody else is around. November of last year, they codified the rules on how to remove a president for being mentally incompetent. But old Joe here stutters, stammers, still thinks he's in the Senate and everything else. They're going to vote him out and put the one that they really wanted in all along, the vice president. But what's going to happen? Then? I don't know. Then that may not happen. I mean, Lord could come back tomorrow. Hallelujah. But if we have to go through it, and I don't think that's going to happen because America got to go away before tribulation can start. But what if the economy goes belly up and all we have is the hand of the government? Well, I got something better. It's called the hand of God. But there's a lot of people that they'll take the first hand out they can get. Because this right here, what I can see in front of me, that doesn't take faith in order to get. There were a lot of people that when God took everything away from them that they knew, they lost their homeland. I mean, you can study Ezra and Nehemiah. They lost the temple. They lost the walls of the city. They left it all raised. There wasn't anything left to go back to. So they said, we'll embrace what's here now. But there were those that said, no, the old ways, even though we can't see them, even though we can't go back and visit them, even though we don't have the same place, Solomon's temple, to go and worship God in, God's still worthy of being worshipped. God's going to find out who's real and who just comes and sits on the pew. In fact, he already knows it. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. But God will prove it one day. 
But Daniel understands that even though he's done what God's told him to do, he could have done more. But what did we do with the time where people was laid off at home? How many of us just tuned into the news? How many others actually got into things of God? When God gave you more time, how did you use it? Right? Even in our daily lives. My phone's got this nice little thing. It dings every Sunday morning at about 8.30. tells me how much time on average I was on my phone every day. And then I can swipe it, and it'll tell me how much time I spent on each app. Texting, emails, phone calls, my solitaire game. And then a whole bunch of other ones. Well, I mean, did not say that the tithe, the Bible says that the tithe belongs to God. What if we tithed our time? What if we gave an offering above that? What if we were as devoted to Him as He is to us? There's not a moment that goes by that we're not on His mind. He knows the number of hair that's on your head, even for those that, Brother Ray, He shaves them, but He's still got them, and God knows how many of them is in His head still. Going to grow back out. But you can spend enough time and count the hairs on your own head. It'd be a waste of time. If you're like me, you lose track after a while. I can't even count money at work. You know, if I, I'm thinking about something, else, I get lost somewhere at around, you know, 20, 21, somewhere in there. Because I start thinking about other things. Well, how many of us Christians, we're good until about 20, 21, 22, but then we get distracted with other things? Daniel's saying, I understand now how serious God was about his word. Are we as serious about God's word as he is? Because God said any minute. That's what the first eight verses are all about. God said He was going to send it, but we didn't believe that He was going to send it. God said keep His laws to follow His Word because God thinks very highly of His Word. But Israel didn't think highly of God's Word. They were confused because they put their confidence in something else and it failed them. But Daniel, he knew... God will never fail you. God still deserves all the righteousness in verse number 8. I mean verse number 7. Right? Verse number 9. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. He says, God's still great and greatly to, be, be, to greatly be praised. But he's saying, we shouldn't have had to figure that out during judgment. We should have known it all along. Do you understand that as a part of those that will be judged, as God starts bringing to light, and, you know, America's going to have to start paying for the things, that, and we already are now, but the millions and millions of babies that we've aborted, right, the deals that were done behind closed doors because Americans didn't pray about who God wanted to be in office, so they voted who they thought, and now they have to pay the consequences of those that they put into office. God may have sanctioned it, but that didn't mean that that's what God wanted to happen. He may have permitted it, and it may be a part of His permissive will, but it may not have been God's perfect will. Who's to blame for that? Well, those that put them in. As much preaching as we've heard in this church, how accountable do you think we're going to have to be? Even America as a whole... Who do you think is going to get the judgment worse? Those that have never heard a clear-cut presentation of what God desires out of their life? Or those that was a country founded upon Christian principles and the oracles of God? One where the Word of God spread like nowhere else throughout the world, had some of the greatest revivals that's ever happened in the history of the world, and yet now, look at what she's become. Don't get me wrong. If you're saved, you're still saved. You're still one of God's. He doesn't forsake those that follow after Him, but you still may be a slave in a foreign land. He may promote you, but you still weren't free. Daniel didn't have a home. He had a borrowed place that the king let him have. Daniel didn't have a cupboard where his food was. He ate at the king's table. He ate what the king said to eat, and he didn't have an option. 
But what about all those other Israelites? Some of them bought and traded like animals. Some of them brought back under a harsh taskmaster just like in Egypt. Some of them sold out. They married into all the things God said not to be a part of. They knew better. They were taught better. They were raised better. They were held more accountable. Nowhere do you find that the king had to deal with the judge. He was a heathen. Well, until... Depends on which one. There's a couple of kings throughout here. But once God showed them who the real God was, you find that all of them got in step pretty quick. They understood that's the real God. But yet the same thing happened before the people of Israel that were there, and how many of them didn't get in? We've heard that story before. I've tried that before. Well, obviously not. Because if you'd have tried this, it'd have stuck. You'd been a new creature. May have become a prodigal. Well, you've still got a seed at the Father's house. But how many prodigals, when this hit, instead of going back to God's house, they ran even further? They may have been dabbling, but now they were in neck deep. If it can happen to them, it can happen to us. God's no respecter of persons. What's the difference? Well, the difference is everybody in Daniel chapter number 9 had confusion of faces. Before that, those that had confident faces, they still had confident faces afterwards. Those that were confused beforehand were still confused after. It caught everybody by surprise when the Medes and the Persians rolled in and took Israel captive. Didn't surprise God. But even those that were doing the will of God, they still had to suffer their homes being torn down. They still had to suffer being carried away, watching all their riches go into somebody else's pocket. You don't think it affected people? Go read Ezra and Nehemiah. They laid the foundation of the new temple and they remembered the glory of the old one and it broke their hearts. But at the same time, they were rejoicing because they were putting back together the thing that said, we want God more than we want anything else. Some people got broken. But through their brokenness, they were still confident that they knew what to do, that God was still God. I mean, I was thinking this morning, Daniel was made principal over all the princes doesn't say that all the princes and the other two principles doesn't say that they were all Medes or Persians I wonder how many were taken out of that lot that came with Daniel I wonder if there were any other Israelites in that group because the Bible says that they all conspired against Daniel I wonder if he got stabbed in the back not just by people that he had worked around but people that he grew up with people that when they were in that trial period where they were supposed to get you know, stronger, that you know, they weren't supposed to have any disease, that they were proven to be wise so that they could offer counsel unto the king. I wonder how many other Israelites didn't join the four. And they envied Daniel because he came out stronger than they were. That they, well, how come Daniel gets everything? We came from the same place. We knew the same people. We was raised the same way. So they tried to take Daniel out. How many people that we think are all in aren't going to be all in when things get hard? Daniel didn't let it affect them. Those that are confused looked at other people. People don't have answers. You want proof? Go back and watch a YouTube compilation of some of the things that they started saying back in you know, January of last year and then watch it, how it's changed month to month and then year to year. Nobody knows what they're talking about. They're ever learning. They're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why did it happen? Because God allowed it. Well, how do we stop it? Don't know. God does. Well, why did I get it? Because God wanted you to have it for some reason. Why don't you ask Him what He wants you to do while you have it? Maybe God wanted to give you two weeks to where... You could devote time to praying for that person that you've prayed for for years, but God said, I'm doing something in their life. You might want to get serious about praying. Maybe somebody's going through it and God wanted to give you a chance to lift them up in intercessory prayer. I don't know. 
Maybe God just wanted to give you some time for two weeks where all you could think about was Him. I, trust me, I know how miserable live streaming was. You think it was easy teaching to a camera? That's not fun. Still did it. It's the right thing to do. I wanted to help people. I did my best to study like I always do, but it's weird. Didn't like it. But yet, you know, we embraced it for a while, and then God let us come back and start having services. People were excited for a while. We had some great services for a bit. Because people got confused and realized that God could resolve it, but then once God took away the problems that caused the confusion, they reverted back. You know what happened after God delivered Israel out of the Medes and the Persians? That he's under the uh, Romans. You know what happened after that? Rome fell and then they were dispersed through many nations. You'd have think that they had learned their lesson. But then, I mean, you start reading some of the prophecies about how God would cause mountains to bury God's people. Then go and study the Holocaust and how they buried them in mass graves with bulldozers just pushing dirt on top of them. Every time that God took away the confusion, they didn't return to the thing that gave them confidence. And they had to keep paying and paying and paying. Why do you think we're any different? Well, yeah, we're at church today. But Daniel realized we have departed. We have sinned against God. wonder if God showed Daniel all the times that he could have told somebody, but he didn't. That he could have been the one to inspire confidence in another by introducing them to the Word of God. He knew the Word of God. Read verse number 2. He said, in the first year of Darius' reign, God explained to me what he used Jeremiah to preach about. He knew what Jeremiah preached. He knew what the prophets taught. He knew the law of God. But I wonder how many people he told. It's great that we know but how many people we told? The commandment was, go ye. And by the way, ye, that's a, it's a big word. It's two letters, but it means everybody. Thou means one. Ye means all. The sometimes means oneers. Sometimes it means all. But when he says, go ye, he's talking to everybody. You may not go far, but when you go, what do you do? Daniel realized, I didn't do enough. I'm just as guilty as everybody else. Because one sin lumps us in with all sin. But yet he still had a confident face because he knew to go or knew where to go to get it made right. You find, verse number 3, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplication and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love Him. He understood the only thing that's got me to where I am now is the mercy of God. But he still made a confession. He realized, Lord, I could be more for you. Granted, this is after he's been to the lion's den. This is after God's elevated him and he's done righteously in the eyes of God, basically ruling this country. Then it was a great nation. Go study it out, the Medes and the Persians. Whole lot of land there for a little bit. But even after another one came in and replaced that, still find Daniel. Still found favor in the eyes of God. He had confidence. But it was because of that confidence that he was confident he could have done something more for God. He believed God so much that when God showed him all that Israel had done wrong, he realized, well, that's me. He didn't pick and choose and say, well, yeah, there's a lot of people out there that have done them things, God. No wonder you judged us. He said, no, I'm just as deserving. God doesn't judge everybody else and then judge God's people. He judges them as a whole. Everybody. Everybody. They'll take care of you through it, but you still got to suffer through it. You willing to? Are you prepared to? 
may not come tomorrow, but it's coming down the pike. And then, <laughs> what did John, John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way of the Lord? The way was already set. God had told that, starting back in Genesis chapter number 3, that the Son of God was going to come. The way was set. What was he doing? He was taking leaves and twigs and the neglect of all the years, and he was saying, you remember the one that used to talk to us? Well, he's getting ready to show up and do a whole lot of talking. He's going to do a whole lot of walking too because he's coming not through a prophet, but he's coming himself. He was dusting off the cobwebs of people's remembrance saying God hadn't forgot about you why did you forget about him right? the way is still the same but if you don't prepare it today it won't be ready to use tomorrow Daniel didn't have to go and consult somebody on how to pray he'd been doing it his whole life and you know what I believe I believe that when Daniel prayed God not only listened but God took it seriously because God spoke back. It wasn't one of those things where God had to wink at our ignorance for all the things that we're asking. He just got down and did business with God. Said, God, you're holy, I'm not. Show me what to do. Unless we have that mindset, we'll have confusion of faces. Every time we look back at the things of God, it'll bring shame because we realize we knew better. We knew where to go to get the answer, but yet too full of pride, too full of lust, too full of envy to go and seek it out. But it's not just those that continually... If there was a day that I didn't go and do it, I'm just as guilty as everybody else. So when it happens, don't ask why. You know why. Why is because we're not holy. Why did God allow this to happen to me? Because he allowed it to happen to everybody else. Why are you... There's only one person that was special. His name is Christ. But yet in the hardness, maybe at the time... I've said it before. I'll say it again. We'll end with this. You know the only way to tell if a diamond is a diamond? Take another diamond and scratch it. See if the diamond that you're curious about can scratch the other diamond. Because diamond's the only thing that can cut diamond. You take a hammer and an anvil, hit a diamond, diamond's going to go into the anvil because it's stronger than the steel. You know how to tell if something's real? You've got to put it through hardness to see if it can handle it. Gold, real fickle. That's why they don't make 24 karat gold necklaces. It's too soft. It bends. That's why they used to bite the coins back in the old cowboy movies. Gold was soft enough that you could leave a tooth dent in it. Right, that's why they do about 14 karat, 18 karat, 16 karat gold. They mix it with other stuff to make it stronger. If you made a hammer out of gold, the weight wouldn't be able to support itself. It'd start bending without you even swinging it. But those things that are hard, the only way to test it, you got to put it through hardness. God said that we'd be gold, silver, but he also said precious gems. You can look at something and tell if it's gold or not. You can put something on somebody's wrist and when it starts turning it green, that's not gold. That's a real easy spot. Same thing with silver. Uh, you can look at if it, tin and silver are next to each other, you know which one's silver or which one's tin. But see, diamonds are harder to tell. There are a lot of people out there that have come up with things because God's blessed them with wisdom. You can try them. They're going to work. God said you reap what you sow. You do good, you reap good. But you really want to find out if something's valuable, you're going to have to put it through real hardness. You're going to have to have everything else scraped up against you to show that what you've got is harder than everything else they've got. Daniel went through a whole lot, but God used him to do a whole lot. He didn't escape the judgment. He's a part of it. But through it, he got things made right, and God did business with him. Promote him. He said in the verses that we read that he shows mercies to those that love him just keep loving God everything's going to be okay you may lose a whole lot but that's just because you didn't need it all you need is God I like having what I've got but if God took it he's still God he's all I need 
Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.